If you are just starting out polishing paint or you want to level up your game, this is the podcast for you. Hi, I'm Ivan. I'm Nick. And this is Jason Kilmer on the DIY Detail Podcast. The Sandman, one wing. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, probably the world's best at polishing paint. Jason, welcome to the DIY Detail Garage. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, guys. What do you What do you think of it so far? I like it. I, I like the the old gritty feel. I mean, if this building could tell stories, it would tell a lot of stories. Yeah, and you know, part of the stories would be this used to be a really dirty shop. We've cleaned it up a lot, and Jason is our first guest in the shop. This is the first vehicle that we're having in the shop. Yes, we have a little Ferrari Testarossa behind us. Uh, no big deal. Yeah. No, actually, there's a lot of intentionality behind that. Right. This vehicle. You here, uh, obviously you can see the sign behind us. We'll talk about C6 Ceramics later, but you know, we're launching polishers, right? We're speaking to the DIY, the enthusiast out there, but also someone who does this for a living. Right. The, 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 these products and what we have to teach, like there's a lot to it. Right, and Jason just doesn't polish for a living. Uh, Jason chases perfection and You've been doing this for 20 some years now? Yeah, uh, at that level, uh, just about 20 years now. Yeah. yeah, he hasn't found perfection yet. So those of you out there thinking that I make perfect paint, no. But you can make darn good paint, and that's what we're here to talk about. Yeah, we talk about making darn good paint. You've spent a year on a vehicle. Before. Can we just do a quick bio real quick sure. of like, who is Jason Kilmer if you've been living under a rock? Uh, I know you've won a lot of awards, many of which people may not even have heard of. Mm -hmm. So yeah. just to give someone the elevator speech of like who they're, who they're hearing it from. Sure. Um, two of the major types of awards is Pebble Beach. That is European concourse type level. And then there's the Riddler, which is hot rod custom car. I've won them both multiple times. Yeah. And then a whole host of um, other wins, SEMA wins, magazine covers, uh, have worked with many other companies in our industry, uh, helping products, teaching, training, um, a little bit of everything. Yeah, uh, Jason is very humble, uh, we'll give him that, but he's won more things than you could possibly think of winning. And he's been behind the scenes on a lot and a lot of the TV shows that you love and watch about you know, the builders and the, that midnight frenzy of the car is being delivered to the customer tomorrow and we have to get it perfect and all that. Jason is the one behind the camera, or you know, when the cameras turn off, he's the one actually doing the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a lot of these garages, this type of atmosphere where it's, the floor's not as clean. Yeah. Uh, it's a dirty floor and we gotta do what we gotta do. Yeah. But so, I know that you've talked about Michael Jordan being kind of an idol of yours. I think of just more recently Kobe Bryant as the guy who just had this amazing work ethic. And if people want to get to your level, they got to start at the beginning. But I want, first of all, folks to know the level of effort you've put in over the years. And maybe it's a consistency thing where you practice a lot. But I don't know, like, where would you start with somebody if they want to get the, to be the best polisher that they can be, yeah. whether they've never done it before sure. or they've, they've yeah. been a detailer for a while? You have to start from somewhere. Whatever that is, everybody's different. Now with me, it's completely different because I also have a disability. So fat, to go backwards, I had to work that much harder just to be equal. So I took certain principles and procedures that I learned online. You know, we didn't have the online when I started. You mentioned disability. If folks don't know you, yeah. can we start there? I was born with uh, cerebral palsy on my right side, but I also have no lack of depth perception on my left eye. So not only am I have a disability or two of them, but they're opposite. So that makes it even more of a challenge. So I, I look at it as it was always a challenge for me to get to a certain level and as each stair level I took or step I took, I got a little bit better, a little bit better, and a little bit better. You have to give yourself grace, but also you have to hammer down and keep on going. If, if you, how far you want to go is how far you want to go. You have to put in the time, the effort, and the work to do it. Where did you start? No internet? You're facing no internet. the obstacles that, that you're born the with. Challenges, like, yeah. Those have also been your blessings. It's a, it's a, it's a, 
it's a blessing that I have a disability, yes. Because I see things and I do things differently. I have to focus more on what I have than what I don't have. So that's why I, I, I really like the simplicity of your lineup, because it's simple. You don't have very many choices, so what that forces you to do as you, you go up in your skill set, right, as you go through this journey, it gives you not very many choices. So you have to really hone in on each product and know what it can do and what it can't do and everything else in between. Excellent. Now, we're here to talk about polishing. We're here to talk about sanding. And one of your nicknames is the sand Sandman. Sandman. Yeah. And the reason for that is Jason, you know, a lot of people, they, they brag online that, hey, I spent 30 hours polishing a car. Uh, how many hours do you spend on a car? Um, minimum, if we're sanding or polishing, doing anything a little more critical, it's 150 on a Yeah, and you've spent, hours. You spent months on some cars. Months and a year on one. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot more involved to Jason's level of sanding and polishing. And most of us in the detailing world, whether you're a beginner or even a professional detailer, we're generally working on factory paint. And factory paint is very, very different than what Jason typically works on. You've worked on factory paint, obviously. Mm -hmm. You've worked on you know, the, the Pebble Beach Concourse cars. A lot of them are original paint. Mm -hmm. and that actually brings more value and more, more points to them if they have that original paint. So in some cases, you're polishing for perfection. In mm -hmm. some cases, you're polishing for preservation. For preservation, exactly, yeah. yeah. And when we're dealing with factory paint, we want to polish for preservation. Yep. On, on, a, on a perfect level, yes. Yeah. Where, where we say sanding or, and sand to improve, not remove, on factory clear is just trying to improve usually that scratch. Right. Usually that key scratch or that bike accident that your, uh, your son or daughter may have done in your brand new car. Right. Try to improve it. Sand to improve, not remove. And factory clear, that's the car that you have, that right. you got from the factory. It hasn't been repainted in a body shop. It hasn't yeah. been custom built in mm -hmm. one of your yeah. you know, garages where you're doing these show cars. Yeah. So, so this is the vehicle that, that, that was purchased, has the scratch. Mm -hmm. You say sand to improve, not remove. Yep, exactly, exactly. So we take a couple passes at it and then hands off and we polish all our scratches. And it is, at that point, it is what it is. Yeah. And if you want to accept the fact that this scratch, if I can polish it out, I'm going to repaint this panel, then you might want to go a little you, further. You go a little bit further, exactly. Right. exactly. So if you were going to sand, hand sand, mm -hmm. OEM I, clear coat? I, I would say hand sand because every pass you take, you have control. With a the machine, there are some levels of, of control that you don't have. So um, I, I prefer to hand sand with a little block on a small scratch. Yeah. So you're not, are you ever like uh, hand sanding an entire panel? Or that that's, goes against what we're saying. We're just trying to, emergency, it's so bad, I'm going to take it to the body shop. I'll try, I'll try to just acutely handle this particular Usually scratch. we just stay within uh, the perimeter of the scratch. OK. Yeah. yeah. On, on OEM. On OEM, Yeah, yeah. Yes. when he's doing the yeah. show cars, obviously he's polishing, you know, sanding yeah. and polishing every yeah. square inch, including the engine, the transmission, the tunnel, the frame, the suspension, you name it, he's polished it. Yep. Uh, and they're, very, they're two very, very different levels of what people are doing. Very and much so. Most detailers are working on factory paint. And again, sanding on factory paint has its advantages, but it has its disadvantages. And one of them is, you know, a lot of people, we see that, we get this question a lot. How do I remove orange peel? Sand it. Yeah. But is it a good thing to remove orange peel? No. Uh, with today's factory clear coats that we have, in the early 90s, the late 80s, I've done a lot of those cars. We yeah. had a lot more material. Now we don't have that. And it's different paint different materials a lot of these panels are aluminum most of them are aluminum yeah. and then plastic beforehand with all the paint we had steel which right. is different so it's a it's a different level that we have now and the the cost of the vehicles are higher so it's a really it's a catch-22 honestly yeah. and you know today to repaint a car is more expensive than the first cars I owned that I paid new. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, a good paint job is upwards of $10,000. Oh, yeah. I mean, a quick bumper repair could be two or three grand. Right. So that's why we never really tell you to use sandpaper on OEM clear coat. No. So, but if you ever were to do it, 
What's the most aggressive grit you would ever use on a scratch? Um, I typically tell people no, no lower than 1500. And the lower the number, the more aggressive. The lower the number, the more aggressive, yeah. And just a few passes and that's it. You just have to be okay with it being there or not being there because yeah. you want the paint on your car. And so you do that and then would you go to 2000 after uh, that? Yes, I step my grits, gr grits up, so 15, 2003. Usually, um, if you do a good job on those previous grit scratches, you can get by sometimes with just hand rubbing and being really controlled and precise. What do you mean yeah. hand rubbing it? Just taking a, 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 a towel, a microfiber towel and some polish and just hand rubbing it. The, the final sand scratch is out? The final sand scratch yeah, 2000 out. grit, if you've done it right, like you said, if, you know, uh, the, the finish that's left by 3000 grit is very easily polished. Yeah. And some uh, sandpaper manufacturers will sell you a 5000 and an 8000 grit, which is basically polished at that point. Yeah, yeah, it becomes very easy at that point. One thing that I asked you about when we first met six years ago at, at the rag company in Idaho, I said, what, what scares you? And you said every time you put sandpaper to paint. Uh -huh. So do not take this lightly. Can you yeah. communicate that message in yeah. case people thought, ah, oh, we're now advertising, just go sand the Ferrari? No, um, because we're taking material off a of car that actually should be on the car. On the show car side of things, it's different. It is designed to take off material. So we have more material to work with to take off the material to get as, as flat and smooth as possible. On an OEM level, we don't have that built into the uh, the paint system. So the fear, yeah, the, the the fear is making a mistake that has to go to the paint shop and costs a lot of money. And costs, costs a, lot a lot of money. money. And also, you know, on something like this, as an example, if this vehicle were repainted, it devalues the vehicle. So the factory paint is worth its weight in gold. On par. probably is it's worth its weight in gold. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know the prices these days but basically you can never replace the factory clear coat the body shop clears it's a completely different paint system that they can do in the factory than they do in a body shop in a factory they're baking it at 325 degrees you we can't do that in a body shop you know when you get the booth up to like 140 150 some people push it a little higher than that but the car is assembled there's plastics everywhere. There's all sorts of things going on in the car. Whereas in the factory, when they're painting these, they're empty. It's just metal that's going into a tank of primer and then it, you know goes down the line. So they can heat it up much higher than we can do with today's cars. And like Jason said, a lot of these cars have plastic parts on them now, uh, and the the way they're painting them in the factory cannot be replicated in the body shop. That makes sense. So obviously having that healthy level of fear is good. All right, let's just talk about broadly speaking. There's someone out there watching this or listening to this podcast. They want to get better at polishing paint. Mm -hmm. What is Actually, something- we'll Back that up. Okay. They want to start polishing paint. They want to start polishing paint. Yeah. Yeah, like you've never done it before. Yeah. So what, how, how would you start? I like to go with a rotary. And you can go as simple as buying a cordless drill. Um, just to feel how that rotation is on a painted surface. Preferably a junkyard hood, a fender, something like that. Um, get the motion, get the skill down of how the tool is. That's first and foremost. Once you get that down and you start to feel comfortable, then you can see how you're doing with different lights and spotlights. And then from that point, just keep on practicing a little bit higher and a little bit higher and, and really test your skills. That's how I usually like tell people to start out. You mentioned light. Mm -hmm. I think lighting is so critical when you're looking at paint. I know that you sometimes never use any, because we're teaching a method that is simple and works for everybody and gets them to perfectly acceptable, super shiny paint, depending yeah. on what they use, whether it's wool, you know, waffle, depending on the paint, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. But we're talking about taking it to this degree with Jason, right? So, yeah. so I think lighting is super important. What if people don't even know what they are seeing? They don't know what they're seeing or not seeing, like what light should they use? What advice do you have for lighting? Mm -hmm. um, I would say just a single point light. So that could be your flashlight on your phone. Shut off all the lights, or if it's dark outside like it is right now, you shine that singular source about four feet off the surface 
what you're trying to see and you can see most of the time the little sh you know shiny scratches and swirls yeah that's our baseline that's what we have to work with and they're going to start to see what you see using exactly. that kind of lighting mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so you're just starting out maybe a cordless drill a rotary you know we teach a flat pad how, how do you like to help people with a rotary for the first yeah. time yeah so it's 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 a simple movement um, you use one hand, you just pull the trigger and keep your hand, you got to keep good posture and good body mechanic. Keep it within your frame of your body. And then I just teach people just to move it. If you want to go to the right, I tilt it to the right or the left and then tilt it to the right and come back. It's a simple movement. It's within two to three degrees tilt. Yeah, the, the tilt is not enough to lift the pad off yeah. the surface. It's just it's not really a tilt even, it's almost just a bit It's of pressure, pressure, pressure on, the, on the outside. Yeah. Just to see what it does and get familiar yep. with yep. what little micro movements on my wrist affect yeah. This, yeah. this polisher weight. So mm -hmm. you'll notice when I'm polishing, I hold the machine with this finger wrapped around the cord yep. and one finger underneath the front. I'm letting the machine balance itself. And Jason does the left and right movement, I do the up and down. Yeah. Ends up being the same thing. So I. I vary the movement by my back hand, usually my right hand, going up and down. So if you lift up a little bit, it goes one way. If you go down, it goes the other way. Why, why do you recommend folks maybe try a rotary first? Because it's a smooth action. With a DA, it's, it's a great tool, fantastic tool to have since the invention of the DA sanders and, and polishers that we have. But a rotary, just a smooth action, and it's... It's, one, it's a little bit hard to master, so I like to start there as a baseline because a, a DA is fairly simple to use. But if you've never used either, maybe the rotary is, is less complicated because you haven't heard all the spiel yeah. about the rotary gonna make you burn paint, and if you can get the rotary, then the DA is, is, is a lot simpler to use, or? Um, it's di they're different movements, so that you use the tool a little bit differently, but it's, it's still the same body mechanics. Yeah. So you, as long as you keep it within your body frame and just keep it nice and even, you're going to be okay. And the, the DA, because of the vibration, or not the vibration, but the, the oscillating mo motion of it, it's a little easier to control in one way, but a little harder in another. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it, it, like Jason said, it's a very different machine. But I always taught people, I always start teaching people with the rotary as well. And the reason for that is, First of all, if they followed any Facebook or you know back in the day forums and stuff like that, they're afraid of the rotary. It's this big monster that's going to rip paint off the car within five seconds. And getting them over that fear is like, oh wait a minute, this is easier than I thought. And someone who's never ever polished before. Remember at Car Supplies Warehouse, we had Jason's wife Amy, and she had never touched polisher in her life. And which one did she prefer? The rotary. Yeah. Uh, you know we had Emily here. Same thing. Emily the audio nerd. They're, sm they're smooth and quiet. Yeah. I get it now. I was yeah. never a rotary guy until yeah. I heard your sermons on high, <laughs> and, you know, finish with a rotary, and it's like, I'm interrupting you. But the rotary is, is awesome, and if you start with it, I could see how that's a good foundation. Yeah. Because I started six years ago, I just had a dual action in my hand right away, yeah. you know? Yeah. When we started, the dual action yeah. wasn't no, a thing. Not, not, even, not even on the radar. No. There wasn't no. even microfibers. No. So. Yeah. yeah. What did you cut with? No, he was talking no. about the, the towels. Oh, the towels. Yeah, yeah, yeah Terry yeah. towels. Yeah. We were using T-shirts on show cars. Yeah, T-shirt or diapers. Diapers, cotton yeah, diapers. that too, yeah. If, you, yeah. if you had money, you had cotton diapers. Yeah. yeah. I wonder. <laughs> that's why I had T-shirts. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't exactly. have any money. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's wild. So w how did your, like, my business when I had a shop was Hawk Pro Detailing, and I, I looked at it like, I see defects in your paint like a hawk views its prey. Like, I looked at the eyesight as a very important thing. So. I, I wonder, with you, your disability, what did that enable you? I'm sure some senses are more yeah. heightened than others yeah. aren't. So what did that help you with in terms sure. of polishing paint? So my right eye is my dominant eye. It, it goes in and out of focus like a camera. So I can see defects a lot quicker than, than normal people can. And you learn over time to not look what's in the paint. You're looking just at the surface of the paint. And Playing with lighting, you see things very different. Uh, if you can learn to look at the surface of the paint and not look into the paint, that really makes a difference. But it takes a lot. Like 
you've mentioned it a couple of times. I'll see something on a car from ten feet away, and you're going like, "How did you see that? You don't, you never." You're the that. only person. You and then a friend of mine, Jamie Gonzalez, and so yeah. like both of you, and then Jason as well, with backgrounds and painting and body shops, like who have painted cars before. You guys show me stuff that I thought I knew every whatever. I didn't yeah. know anything, but I thought I saw everything, and I, I didn't see any of the stuff you guys yeah. were pointing out. No, and you know, for Jason here. You do show cars, you're doing them in that shop and that frenzy of, you know, everybody trying to sell the car the last minute. You get it as good as you can, and then you bring it to the show floor with different lighting, and you see stuff you didn't, yeah. you've never seen before. Yeah, we bring, we bring spray guns, we bring polishers, we bring sandpaper, we bring anything that can happen, does happen, and will happen, we bring it with us. Yeah. So how does that wisdom translate then to the person who's just starting out or wanting to get better? You know, maybe they want to remove defects, mm -hmm. right? But they may not realize that by removing defects, that inflicts its own scratch pattern. And they have to polish that out. Yeah. Like, remember, this is people who are just starting out. They may not know any of this. Yeah. We, you We've just, already forgotten sure. half the stuff. You just have to start somewhere and use something as your baseline. If you want, basically paint's supposed to look like colored glass. If a piece of glass was colored and no scratches in it, that's what we would like to get as, as close as possible. Yeah. But again, that's the show car. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. The, the daily driver, when someone would come to my shop and say, I want you to wet sand, I want you to eliminate the orange peel, I want a piece of glass. Yeah. We could do that. That was a service we offered. But I would, my question to them would be, what kind of trailer are you picking it up on? Yeah, yeah, they're like, huh? <laughs> yeah, what? and if it's a daily driver, sure you can do that, but you're inflicting a lot of uh, wear and tear on yourself because keeping it clean is gonna be difficult. Everything is gonna mark that paint. Well, and now you can see it more because you've removed the peel, which hides a lot of that stuff. Now you can see it even more. Now, orange peel, I know what it is, but I didn't know what it was for a while. Sure. What is orange peel? And then once you tell me that, is having a lot of it mean that you have a lot of clear coat on the paint? Okay. Orange peel is basically, that's what it is. It, you look at a surface of an orange skin, and it looks kind of peely and textury. That's what, when clear coat comes out of a robot or a spray gun, it comes out peely. Now you can adjust that from a manufacturer standpoint or a body shop standpoint, but it's gonna come out peely at some level. Yeah, because the, the way the paint is transferred from the gun to the car is miniature droplets. And those droplets, if you think of you know depositing drops of water on the surface, we all love beads on our car, right? That's basically what it's doing, but we're putting beads on top of beads on top of beads, and you're ending up with this undulating surface. And another way of looking at it, and I've seen cars that are almost this bad, golf ball. Mm -hmm. So it's the texture of the orange. That the texture on the orange peel is what we're referring to. And a golf ball would be an extreme example, and I'm sure there are cars out there that have been you know, painted in the backyard uh, with a spray can that they get pretty close to a yep. golf ball. Yep, yep. Yeah. I've seen better and I've seen worse than yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. yeah. I think a common misconception could be, because I used to think this, is that a lot of that look meant, I had a lot of clear coat to work with. Let me grab the sandpaper on OEM paint and start to go to town. Mm -hmm. That's no. not the case. No, no, no. Not, not. It's actually probably most further from the truth because you can adjust how things are sprayed to look really poor, but where did the paint go? It didn't go in the car. Sometimes it goes up in the air. So if it doesn't go in the car, it's in the air, that means you don't have as much material to work with. Yeah, and wow. when you think about it, the, the most expensive part of a car today is the paint. It's more expensive than any. It costs more, uh, you know, maybe not a car like this, but we'll talk your average daily driver, you know, your, your Chevy, your Ford, your Honda, whatever. You can get a long block engine installed for a lot less than repainting the car with a quality paint job. Mm -hmm. You can get, you know, there's some franchises that I don't, Mm -hmm. Do they still do a thousand dollar paint job? I uh, know they're they're even way up. There. Okay, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, but basically, you can get that you know that cheap paint job is still more expensive than an engine. So you need to maintain your paint, and with the manufacturer's aspect of it, that is the most expensive. They're literally paying paint to dry. So the less coats they can put on, the less amount of time it spends curing, the faster they can crank the cars up. 
So there's a reason why they're putting less clear on the on the vehicles, yeah. and, and again, why you should be very yeah and careful when you're when you're thinking about heavy defect removal. Right, and if we think of that, um, the orange peel as peaks and valleys. Well, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, yeah, the peak was a lot higher, and the valley gave you that you know 50 micron or two mils thickness. Now the peak is at that two mil thickness, and the valley is maybe down at one mil or less or less or less. Yeah. Do you use a paint thickness gauge? Um, yeah, I use it as a guide on OEMs when it's when it's not when it's been resprayed, body work, that sort of thing. It, it doesn't even read on the gauge because we have so much material to try to get it as flat and level as possible. Yeah. Is there a brand you recommend? Is the fifty dollar one on Amazon or the two thousand dollar one? Like, it, does it matter? What? No, I, I I think they're pretty inconsistent in general. Yeah. Um, we that's a whole nother podcast, but yeah. Yeah, and you know the, the paint thickness gauge, like Jason said, it's just a guide. Yeah. Right. It gives you a general idea, but if you put the paint thickness gauge on the vehicle. And whether it be a $50 one or a $5,000 one, you put on the paint, you move it over a quarter inch, it's gonna give you a different reading because that paint is never the same thickness throughout. Mm -hmm. And even after you've done you know, countless hours on a panel or days on a panel, it's still not. It's not super consistent. I mean, yeah. within a half an inch, it may go you know, quite a bit more yeah. or less. I'd like to settle a debate once and for all. Cut with a rotary or finish with a rotary? Mm -hmm. I personally like to cut with rotary. Um, if I have the time, I like to finish with a rotary too. But a lot of times we don't have that time, so it's nice to have the DA as that really solid middle step and finishing step. Or, you know, like I said, if I have the time, I, I really enjoy using a rotary. I honestly do. As a lot of times now we don't have that time on some of these projects. Interesting. Can you talk about the time part? And again, we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> hundreds of hours. Hundreds of like the jobs you do, you know, we're listening. So, yeah. uh, why does it take longer to finish with a rotary in your world? Because we're looking at it from a microscopic, small, like half inch away with the lights off. So, I'm going after every little flaw. The problem is when you put one flaw in, you replace it with 10 other flaws. So when you use a rotary and you're looking at it, say it's jet black, and you're looking at it from a microscope level, it takes more time to be consistent and slow and methodical. It just takes a great deal of time. I think the finish with a rotary is phenomenal, though. But I, I can is. see how the it is. Yeah. I can see how at that level maybe you see more. I don't know. We've well, talked about this a million. Not only that, uh, you know, we've. We've designed a system that's simple and easy and accessible. Uh, some of the, the tools that Jason is using, well not the tool itself, but the pads and the polishes, they're a lot more specialized and finishing with them takes a lot more skill. Yeah. We have a rotary drooling pad that literally anyone can pick up and finish without, without squirrel marks and things like that if they follow our instructions. Which is lowest speed on your rotary, yeah. flat pad, Lightly damp pad. Yeah, no pressure. No and, pressure. You know, enjoy yourself. Uh, and the enjoy yourself is actually the most important part. If you're stressed out doing this, it's not going to end well. Uh, but if you're doing this as, wow, this is fun, it's easy, it's, it's, you know, it's enjoyable to do, then you're going to do a better job. It's my favorite. The rotary dueling pad with the system that you yeah. taught me, like, my favorite. It's smooth, it's quiet, it's enjoyable. Right. And it feels like, not that I'm tuned out, but the way that I used to polish paint, I was trying to be as good as you. And it was like, I was in that dark shop until three in the morning, like not, yeah. you know, not good for my health, not good for my family. Like, any, but I was like, do I see a DA like tick? You know what I mean? If so, then I got to redo this. I, like, yeah. And, and once you taught me the rotary drilling pad, it's like, I stopped looking at paint that way. So I wasn't even trying to do that. And uh, even though I wasn't ever getting close, I just didn't even, yeah, yeah. you know, I thought I was trying to achieve perfection, whatever that was. And, and this method just works. Yeah. And you just see it from five feet away like a normal human would, and you're like, oh, that's great. Yeah. You know? Exactly. Um, but I, I, like, I don't even know what I don't know about the yeah. things you do. And yeah. When, when I'm called in a situation, it's usually not a good thing. So it's not fun. It's not enjoyable. It's just getting the job done yeah. in a very short time frame. Yeah. 
And that short time frame, even though he spends hundreds of hours on the car, it might be 20 hours a day for 10 days straight. Yeah, we did, uh, the last big project we did was a Jeep. Um, I actually did two Jeeps for SEMA in two and a half weeks. One of them we did in four days from, from very low grit all the way up. Does yeah. that stress you out just thinking about it or is that just um, another It makes job? my back sore right now, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, was, uh, it was a rough four days. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a big job. It's something that you don't take lightly. And polishing should be fun, it can be fun. On Jason's level, it's not only an art form, but it's very much, you know, hours and hours of skill. You go into your garage, if he's at home, yeah, he's it's, in his garage it's every completely, day it's, it's completely different. I, you know, I get my famous acrylic panel that I love to polish on and I just zone out and just use the rotary and just see what I can do. Yeah. It's really testing, at that point, it's testing my skills. Can I get it a little bit better? Can I do it a little bit faster? Yeah. That's my, that's my focus. Right. Jason is very much, you know, like I mentioned before, the professional athlete of mm. this, you know, of detailing. And the fact that he'll record himself doing it and then spend time watching it to see, okay, I could have improved here. I could have, my, you study your body yeah, mechanics posture. Yeah. as much as the polishing itself. And that is something that a lot of people the body mechanics of what they're polishing, they're overreaching, they're, they're hunched over, they're you know, doing the, I wanna smell the polish sort of thing. That has its place, and Jason is one of the people that has to do that because of the situation he's in. But if you're polishing your own car at home, <laughs> stand up straight, yeah. be square, don't go past your shoulders. There's a lot of things that we've repeated many, many times on this channel, we'll keep repeating. So don't worry if you have missed it before, we'll say it later. But having that posture is going to make detailing your car a lot simpler Enjoyable. and you'll get a better result. Yeah. Yeah. I know you've For used sure. our system and I, mm -hmm. I sent you products a while ago. Anything that you've played around with at home that, that you've found out is kind of a fun way or unique way to use gold standard polish? Yeah, or anything, I, anything? I use less. <laughs> once, once the pad is what I call happy, right? And uh, sometimes I use this trigger spray. Sometimes I like to just dab it. And I, I, I like to feel things and touch things. I know that's not the way to do it, but that's just me. Yeah. Um, using less is w much better on that particular project. So yeah. you find it, you just don't need much, right? You can work it for a long a time. A dot per panel, like a dot. Yeah. That's it. That's all you need. Once it's happy and, and going the way you want it to go. What's the most unique like pad polish combo with a polisher that like got you the finish that you need, like finicky paint that you like couldn't finish down at your level and it was like, I don't know, I used a, a hand saw and you, well, I don't know, like, like what, what's the craziest combo that you needed to get that paint right? Uh, one time I actually finished out with a compound. With a compound? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't even remember what the car was, but it was some really rare, expensive European car and everything we threw at it, every combination, every tool, just didn't work. So we ended up going kind of back to the basics. And it was a, I think it was a firm foam pad and a, a pretty aggressive compound. And it was slow speed and we just kept on working it until it was almost transparent, like almost not there. Was it a, a DA or rotary? It was a DA. Okay, yeah, DA. low speed and just, you just so, worked it. Yep, just yeah. worked it for like, probably 20, 30 minutes per panel. What? Super slow. Where, because it, it was so soft, I couldn't touch it with a brand new towel. Yeah. It was just that finicky. Oh man, detailers out there, you think you've had finicky paint before. That's a wild story. Yeah, yeah. and you know, Jason is working on these repainted vehicles and they'll have multiple, multiple coats of clear. And sometimes the painter, you know, between coat A or, you know, coat six and coat nine, they didn't mix the, the, the paint properly. Right? Yeah, or they're two inches off the surface than they were before. Or yeah. some, ver some human variable that really plays a factor in how I perceive it and what I, what I, what, how I feel it and how it's yeah. responding. So one thing, and I don't want to take this too much longer, you recommend is getting a junkyard hood. Mm -hmm. First of all, what advice do you have for someone out there? We're talking about DIYers, yeah, not yeah. people who've been on cars yeah. their whole life. How do I find a junkyard hood? Which one do I get? Yeah. Like, where do I go? Like, 
let, let me start there because sure. I've been there and I, yeah. I was wondering this yeah. too. Um, I prefer just going to a body shop, uh, body shop down the street. They have junk panels. If you can grab a trunk or a hood, which is something that you can put on a table or some sort of stand, and just you know, buy a buy your system and just see what you can do. Yeah. Look at it with, with a light, with a camera light, one single source. I like and, the DIY method. That's yeah, easy. and just tr try something and see what kind of result you get. And if it's you're getting a good result, can you go a little bit more? Do you need to go a little bit more? That's personal preference. And you're doing it on, on a panel that you're not risking a nasty repaint, right? Yep. You have a freedom to, yep. uh, to try things. Yep. Yep. Try it. Try speeds. Try pressure. Try different tools. Try, try sandpaper try with a block sandpaper. if you want, right? Try, yeah, you can try whatever you want at that point. Yeah. And that becomes the enjoyable part. That's why we detail is because it's enjoyable. That's what it's for. Yeah. That becomes enjoyable. When, when you do it at a, a certain level, it loses some of its joy, but you know, the, the, the rewards in that are winning the awards, you know, collectively uh, grouping up with a team of craftsmen that you're long, you know, I've been friends with some of them for over 20 years yeah. now. So it's, that's a different segment, but yeah, paint, polishing paint is enjoyable. And you know, when you're like, wow, I did that. I, I mean, I took some machines and pads, some combinations, but I did that. It's rewarding. Yeah. It's so rewarding. We're actually recording this the night before that you watch this. So Jason's here for a couple more days. So we actually want to know, what do you want to know from Jason? We read all these comments, we'll answer them. We're in the DIY Detail Garage. Right, so, so this is the first video in the improved DIY Detail Garage. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do. You might have heard the electrician in the background uh, you know, dropping a few things, that's fine. Uh, but basically, it's still a work in progress. And, but we wanted to bring Jason here as our first person invited in the shop. Uh, I've known Jason for many years. Many years. And I have a, an immense respect for Jason and the work that he does. There are not many, you know, might be a handful of people in the world that can do what he can do with paint and a polisher. Yeah. So having Jason here is really an honor for me. And you know, we found this Ferrari. Uh, it's local here in Omaha. It'll be on, uh, be in the auction block soon. So if you want a car that Jason's polished, <laughs> this one will be for sale eventually. But this is a low mileage. It has less than 10,000 miles. It's all original. It's a black book car. So it had, it's gone through all the factory specified maintenance. Everything is there. Jason's not going to be sanding on this car. No, no. no. But my plan is you to- You couldn't pay me enough. No, exactly. My yeah. plan is to kind of go through it with you and ask, how do you inspect paint? What are you looking for? How do you evaluate? What is your test spot process? So we've already got some ideas, but if there's something burning, you know, and you really want to know what his thoughts are on it, please ask us and maybe we can get it into yeah. some content in the next great. couple days. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the other thing is, if you want to get a hold of this guy, Jason Kilmer on Instagram. In Instagram's the best yeah, way. You find him eventually, you know, sometimes on Facebook once every I six pop up every so, here, yeah. there. Yeah. Oh, where's yeah. Kilmer? Oh, he's yeah. there, he's there. Yeah. But uh, Instagram, but he'll be here. We'll be answering the comments from this. Of course, every video we do, and a lot of people don't know this, but we do it as a premiere. So when the video is originally released, and we do it the same time every week, so you know, you can uh, podcast every Friday. Yeah, same bat channel, same bat time. Yes. Or same DIY channel, same DIY time. You're dating yourself, Adam. I know, yeah. But with that, we do a live premiere and we're both on there chatting with the people out there. We usually get at least a hundred people and now you know those numbers are growing exponentially. The other way you can get a hold of us is through our Facebook group. Now we have a Facebook page, like any business, but we also have a Facebook group that's almost fifty thousand people strong. And in the description, yeah, there's a link, just click it. Yeah, and it's a very fun place because if someone is not being friendly or polite, they disappear from the group for some reason. But, uh, you know, it's a safe, <laughs> fun space to ask questions and there's no question that's too new. There's no question that's too basic. There's no question that's stupid. There's occasionally a stupid answer and like I said, they disappear. But the people are there to help. And we have professionals on that group that have been detailing, like myself, for 40, 50 years. And we have people that this is their first day. And the, some, that person that it's their first day detailing, they might have something to teach to everyone else. 
So just because you're new in the business doesn't mean you're not learn you can't help someone. Uh, Jason yeah. and I both do trainings. I learn as much as the students do every training I do. And I'm sure yeah, you're the same. Yeah, same same here. Yeah. Yeah. Because someone that's new and fresh might have a different spin on it or or they might receive what you've information you've given to them a little bit differently than you've thought before. Um, I probably trained four or five hundred people yeah. at a high level, you know. Um, and then also beginner stuff too with some other companies. So I've trained a lot of people and I've heard I think most questions, but there are questions sometimes that I'm like, hmm, I don't know. I'll have That's to get back one. to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you want to know more about some of the mistakes that I feel like I've made in the past, we have a video here. Top ten polishing mistakes. Just a fun one. And uh, continue the learning process. Thanks for watching. Thanks, Jason.